The first scripture reading this morning is from Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 to 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? I would like to invite the children forward for the children's time. So, do you know what it's like to be thirsty? Yes? What's your favorite drink? Coke. Coke? What's your favorite drink? You don't have one? What about you, Violet? I like orange. Orange juice? Very cool. Um, ever been so hungry that you get grumpy? Yes. yes. We have a name for that, right? I'm hangry, right? Right? I'm hungry and angry at the same time. That never happens to any of the adults in the room, I'm sure. No, I'm kidding. Um, We just read a story from Scripture where these people, the Israelites, right, who were in, who were slaves in Egypt, were rescued, were freed. They were led out into the wilderness where they were free. And then they're like, where's the water? What are we going to drink? And if you went to a place and you're like, okay, we're here. Can you understand that they were afraid? Like, how are we going to survive? Because you need water to survive, right? You can live without food longer than you can live without water, right? So they were like, you know, hello, <laughs> where's, where's the water? And they were looking to the, the Moses who... God sent to help lead them out of slavery, out of Egypt, into, into this wilderness. And they're like, now what's interesting is sometimes they were afraid, but sometimes when we're afraid, uh, people get angry. We see it all the time when you see somebody angry, and it's really they're afraid, and they don't like being afraid. Are you sh- shivering like you're afraid? Right? And they don't like to be afraid. And so... Um, And in their anger, they were pointing it at Moses. And Moses goes to God and is just like, hello, help, help. I think they said, it says they're ready to stone me. They're like, they're ready to get violent. Like, where is the water? Um, There's a lot in the Bible about how we, what, about trying to calm us down when we get afraid. Um, And people are different. Some people get real quiet when they're afraid. Some people get real loud when they're afraid. Some people run when they're afraid. Some people, you know, try to find other people who will help. Some people are like, you know, they, they're, when they're afraid, they try to comfort other people. There's all different ways to do it. Moses modeled for us something that we can do when we're afraid. He went to God and he prayed. And he said, Lord, help. I would listen to this uh, 
a, a podcast, and one of the questions that the, the person who ran it would always ask whoever came on her show, what do you do when you're really afraid? Like, you can feel it in your body. Um, you are, you, you're facing a situation that really makes you nervous and anxious, and what do you do? And b every time that she would ask that question, I would answer it by m myself in the car, and I would say, I take a deep breath and I pray. Take a deep breath and I pray. Lord, help. It's good advice. Doesn't mean that you might not, you know, uh, uh, doesn't mean that, that there's not good reasons to be afraid, but it's always good to know that we're not in it by ourselves, that God is with us, and to ask God to come into that so that we can be, remember and, and maybe not get so angry, maybe not get threatened violence, maybe, but we are, but we ask God for God's help. Does that make sense? Thank you for saying yes. Would you fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your heads? Dear God, when we are afraid, and that's part of life, there are things that make us afraid, remind us, Lord, to look to you, to calm us, to remind us to, the, to, to breathe and trust that you are with us. And we thank you for all the people around us who can also remind us that we are not alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. 
he cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months then, four months more then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into that, their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For God so loved the world that the only Son was given that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might know life through him. John 3, 16 and 17. That was where our scripture passage ended last week. We are learning about Jesus through relationships with others in these weeks leading up to Easter. Today, Jesus holds himself accountable to the declaration, for God so loved the world, and he is going out into the world, into Samaria, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, kingdom of God. Now, what you may not understand is that Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Samaritans is almost like a dirty word. They're those people. Recently listened to a podcast on being with Krista Tippett. I've mentioned her before. I, I think her podcasts are absolutely worth your time. And she was interviewing a journalist by the name of Amanda Ripley, who recently wrote a book, High Conflict, Why We Get Trapped and How We Get Out. She's a journalist who had an aha moment in, in how the media is contributing to the high conflict that we are in as, as a nation, as a culture, and that they are feeding into the anger, feeding into people not uh, uh, just feeding into the conflict. When she said that we are in high conflict, it hit me like, duh. But not like accusing her, but like accusing me. Like, duh, yeah. Because there are different levels of conflict. And just so you know, I've been, I've been trained as a mediator. <laughs> I've been trained in conflict management. I teach about le different levels of conflict. And suddenly I, connecting the dots to, you know, talking about uh, levels of conflict in churches and suddenly looking at the larger culture, I went, oh my gosh, yeah. So... I want to talk about the levels of conflict, and I'm going to use a silly example, uh, but it, but it'll 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 teach them as we go. So the first, the level one, is when there's a problem to solve. So just imagine a couple: one wants pizza for dinner, and the other one wants Chinese food, right? And I want. What do you want for dinner? Let's have pizza. No, we had pizza last week. I'm in the mood for Chinese food. But oh gosh, you know. I don't really want Chinese food. I mean, and we could all solve this, right? I'll get pizza, you get Chinese food. Or let's go out for Thai food, right? You know, however you want to do it. But no, it, it escalates to, you know what, you are so selfish. You, it's always what you want. You never ask me what I want. 
uh, it's, you know, this is just so typical of you. Now we're notching up the conflict, right? So now it's becoming about personalities. It's not about pizza and Chinese food anymore. It's about you are so selfish and I am so sick of this. And it becomes about the person. Level three, that's level two, when it becomes more personal and less about the issue itself. Level three, it becomes a win-lose. You know, you might enlist people to your side. Hey, kids, your dad wants pizza again. Isn't, you know, does he ever ask us what we want? Isn't he the most selfish person? Is it not true that on your birthday last year, he got his favorite birthday cake for your birthday, and you don't even like, you didn't even like it, and you just pretended that you did to not make a fuss? Isn't your dad just the worst? Your mother, you know, and so, and then, you know, the people who, you know, glom on into the conflict can say, you know, he is selfish. He never listened to me. He didn't let me go out on Friday night. You know, and then it becomes camps. And again, the pizza and the, and the Chinese food are completely forgotten. It's about the people and the, and the relationships, Right. Level four is fight or flight. You know, I don't even know why I stay married to you. We can't even resolve a stupid problem about what we want to have for dinner. This is so typical. I am so tired. But it, <laughs> nobody can relate to any of this, right? Notches up. Do I want to stay? Do I want to go? And again, all about personalities and people... The issues themselves completely forgotten. It's about winning or losing. The compromise, no, there's no compromise. I don't, I want pizza. I, you know, and I can't stand you. Level five brings it up to intractable situations where it, eliminating the person, <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm out. I, I you know, I want a divorce, and I'm going to take you for all you're worth. See that boat outside that you love? Gone. The house, the vacation, gone, right? I'm going to make you suffer. So, some church examples. My church, uh, growing up, one of, I had uh, clergy couple for pastors for for they were there for for 10 years and one pastor preached a sermon on mother's day that god can be my mother too and suddenly uh it it was kind you know in can in we all of our all of our names for god are metaphors right but for some people they just no no uh, and it started out about that issue, but then it was, <laughs> it became about them and whether they, sh- whether they worship the shut-ins enough and whether they work hard enough and whether, you know, and somebody was just like, you know, when my husband died, they were not there for me. They didn't call me enough. They didn't do, you know, and it became about them, right? And then are you, were you with them or were you against them? The church survived, just so you know. When I talk with pastors, you know, you hear about churches that split over the color of the carpet. You know, it's never about the carpet. It's about who gets to make the decisions, right? Why the Smith family? The Smith family has way too much power and control. It's always what the Smith family wants, you know. And my family has been here just as long as the Smith family. And you know, my you know, and I might not be able to contribute as much as they do. But why is it? You know, can you imagine? I have a friend who recently um, they took out pews to expand the children's section in the front of the church. Because <laughs> and it it became about her, the pastor. But the pew, taking out the pews is always, is, you know, watch out, even if the session approves it, watch out. Because I would guess that it 
touched upon the fears of the congregation. You don't think we're ever gonna need those pews again? Do you think that we're dying? Do you think that you know, what you're saying, the fact that you can take out those pews means that, you know, it, that there's no hope? And, and again, when we're fearful, we can turn it into anger and we want somebody to blame for it and, right, and it notches up. It's no longer about the pews, it's about the person and boom. When I first came to Grace, the question is, what's going to happen with the manse? That was, that was what was on the plate of something that could blow up. And I was even told, watch out. Right. So in our public life right now, we are in high conflict, level four and level five. We don't focus on the issues. It's about those people. Those people are the problem. And certain media outlets feed their base. They no longer talk about the problems or the issues. They, the problem are those people. I always get so frustrated when there's like, you know, when somebody, you know, uh, you'll hear, Democrats believe, Republicans believe, speaking for the other person versus talking about the issues, and maligned. All, as if all Democrats believe the same thing, all Republicans believe the same thing. And I know I'm talking about two camps, and there are more than two camps. There are nuanced opinions between Democrats. Same is true for Republicans. We don't agree about everything. But the way we talk about it, or the way it's talked about in the media, is all Republicans are transphobic, all Democrats are socialists, and neither of those things are true. But we have made the conflict about those people versus about the issues. The way out is to listen to one another, to listen to understand, or it will end very poorly for all of us. You all have learned to live together. There are people in this room whose politics are not of your liking. But you know they would be the first person at your door with dinner when you're sick, or to visit you in the hospital or to drive you to the airport, or to help you move. That's a good friend. Somebody who's willing to move those boxes. That's good people. And they voted in a way that you do not understand. But in order for us to live out God's command to love one another as we love ourselves, we need to start listening to understand. And when we do, we'll find out that there are more than two sides to every issue. In this Amanda Ripley interview, they talked about, uh, just briefly, about uh, the abortion debate. Said when you really talk about it, you find out that it's not just two camps. There's more like four or six different nuanced opinions about abortion in this country. I don't know what your media outlet of choice is, but I want you to listen next time you watch or listen. How much is centered on issues and how much is centered on those people? Where are you listening to a news outlet where people are presenting their opinions, seeking to understand one another? How much is speaking for other people versus t talking to people? How much is mudslinging where there's no attempt to understand, there's only an attempt to win? Be careful what you're feeding your mind and your heart and your soul. If you are being fed hatred, remember that you are what you eat. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. It's a lovely mantra. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In this country, we have become addicted to righteous indignation, to anger, to demonizing the other side. And when you think about that, just look around you. The other side, those people are sitting in the pews with you. 
For God so loved the world that the Son was given, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might know life through him. Last week's lectionary passage included the story of Nicodemus, the religious leader who went to see Jesus by night. And today we have Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman at the well in plain sun at midday. And Jesus is breaking social norms. Rabbis don't associate with women by themselves. But Jesus does. Jesus doesn't, or Jews don't associate with Samaritans. She's mystified he would even talk to her. He traveled to Samaria. Why? Maybe to prove the point. God so loved the world. God loves those people. God offers them living water. Did you notice that when Jesus tells the woman that she's had five husbands, that there was no judgment? We can make a lot of assumptions about her and her lifestyle, but we don't know. We do know that Jesus did not condemn her. He offered her living water. And by the way, fascinatingly, the the well is often where young men in scripture meet their future brides. Rebecca meets Isaac, Jacob meets Leah. Jesus offers this woman not his hand, but a relationship with God. And you'll also notice that the main rift between Samaritans and Jews was a a disagreement over where you worship God. The the Samaritans thought it was on Mount uh, Gerizim, or the Jews believed in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, it's not even important. The hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will follow the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Both sides were so sure of themselves. This is where you worship God. And Jesus says, you both have it wrong. And by the way, the gospel was written after the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. Jesus says, it's not important where you worship, it's how you worship, in spirit and in truth. Last week, I referenced the the worship wars from years back, traditional hymns or praise songs, doesn't matter, there's no right way, it's it's personal preference, really, the music. What matters is that it is God-focused, that the spirit is present. (laughs) By the way, that's God's job, not ours, we can't make that happen. It matters that it's not a show, that our faith is real. And that doesn't mean we never have our doubts or or our questions or our struggles at times. But that faith in God is what brings us here and what keeps us going and how we seek to live not just Sunday mornings but every day of the week. One of your strengths as a church is that it is for real. The question, of course, is how to share it. The Samaritan woman went back to town and said, come and see. The best evangelist in my church when I was pastoring in Wharton was a woman in recovery, uh, an alcoholic, and the church journeyed with her through the loss of her children to foster care and their eventual return, her sobriety. And when anyone stood up at an AA meeting and said, hey, does anybody know of a good church? She'd go, Wharton United. She was the best evangelist because she experienced grace, love, living water, prayer, companionship, forgiveness, and the truth spoken in love. In 2023, uh, we churchy people need to realize that we are those people for some people. And it is deserved in some cases. The church has been very hurtful and continues to be. The only way to recover from that is to listen, to own the hurt we've caused, to ask for forgiveness, and to love without condition. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might know life through him. 
In our scripture lesson, the church could be the would-be disciples, or the church could be the disciples wondering, why is Jesus associating with this woman? Or the church could be the woman in need of living water, new life, seeking to expand her community, which will mean for us going out into the community. Come and see. And by the grace of God, hoping to hear what the Samaritan said, we no longer believe because of what you've said, but because of what we've experienced ourselves. God loves those people. And we are those people for others. So let us listen to God, to one another, and share of ourselves, of our faith, of our hopes, our dreams, our fears. And may we come together to live in God's gracious love for all creation. It sounds so pretty, and it's so hard, but it is worthy of our all. May God bless our efforts, because truly it's impossible, absolutely impossible if we don't look to God. And that's the gift. God is with us to see us through this mess. And so we have hope. In Jesus' name, amen.